What is up, YouTube, and welcome into the newest episode of Entertainment Purposes Only. Now, this is going to be the only episode this week, okay? Thanksgiving week, you know, everybody's busy. This is going to be the only episode. We're going to roll in the week 12 recap along with the week 13 preview all in one episode. So, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. There's a lot to get to. So, last week... Had some big games. The headliner, obviously, Washington at Oregon State. The Huskies found a way to get it done. It was not easy. I don't know that it could have been pretty in that weather. Just an absolute monsoon, pouring rain the whole game. But uh, Washington was able to pull it out. Remember, they were slight underdogs in that game. So, I mean, they won by two points. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's a huge win for them. They deserve everything they're getting, you know, The reason they won that game, from what I could tell, was Michael Penix was able to handle those conditions better than DJ Uyunglele. They even had a sideline reporter come on and say that they were making the adjustments during the game. They coaches basically told Penix, all your throws you make, they've got to be able to be caught with the body of the receiver. Like you we just can't throw any passes that are gonna have to be caught with their hands. Because in the rain, everybody was dropping everything. You just can't do it. They were able to make that adjustment, somehow pull it off. The back shoulder throws that Penix is making this year to those receivers, they're unstoppable. I don't know how you defend it. It's been money for them all year. It's how they beat Oregon. It's how they beat Oregon State the other night. It just I don't know what you do to defend it. And that, as a Georgia fan... I think of all the teams that they might potentially play in the playoff, not counting Alabama because they're going to have to play Alabama before the playoff, I think Washington scares me the most. Because like I said, Penix is awesome. The coach is awesome. You got an NFL quarterback and two or three NFL receivers, which if you do that, you have that, you're going to be a pretty dang good college football team, which Washington obviously is, Um, you know. And playoffs going to be those fast tracks. I think the only outdoor spot this year is the Rose Bowl, so that should be good weather. Everything else in an indoor stadium, they're dangerous. They're dangerous. So keep an eye on that. They jumped Florida State in the college football playoff committee ranking this week. Got no issue with it. I think they deserve to be there with or without Jordan Travis's injury. So we'll see. They got a... Big one this week against Washington State in the Apple Cup. Then, presumably, they'll see Oregon again in the Pac-12 championship. But I'm I'm bullish on Washington right now. I think uh, Penix has the goods, so they say. Uh, Georgia at Tennessee. It was obviously all dogs after the first play of the game. Really, what I want to touch on here. You know, this is to an extent a pick show against a spread. For those of you who dabble. I think Georgia is a great candidate for live betting opportunities because they win the toss every week. They defer to the second half every week, as you should. Anybody who wins a coin toss and takes the ball in college or pro football is a moron. But the other team gets that ball first and they score every time. Every time. Since about it happened against Florida, it happened against Missouri, it happened against Ole Miss, and it happened against Tennessee. So if you're looking to bet on Georgia, just wait till the first possession's up. The other team scores a touchdown. You're going to get a much better line. And there's something to think about. Now, I just talked about Michael Penix. If Georgia makes the playoff, Carson Beck is right up there with him. And I think those are the two best quarterbacks in the playoff if they make it there. And there's a big gap. Like, those two guys are head and shoulders above J.J. McCarthy, head and shoulders above Kyle McCord, head and shoulders above whoever Florida State's backup's going to be. And I think they're ahead of Bo Nix. Bo Nix is putting up all the stats, but a lot of his throws are throws that any self-respecting quarterback at the high school level can make. A lot of behind-the-line-of-scrimmage stuff, a lot of real shallow stuff. Nothing against him, but... Anyway, just to say, Carson Beck is balling out right now. He's right up there playing with the best guys in the country, which, again, I mean, 
Bud Elliott of the Cover 3 podcast tweeted this out earlier this week. One of the things going into this season that we were looking for, why there could be a lot of parity, was if Ohio State, Alabama, and Georgia, which are widely considered the three best rosters in the sport, didn't have a quarterback, which Ohio State doesn't. Alabama depends on if you think Milrose actually gotten better or it's been schedule or whatever, but Georgia's got a dog at quarterback, and it just is what it is. Not to say he can't have a bad game, just saying he hasn't really had one yet. So at this point, you know, like what they say about freshmen is at the end of the season, they're not freshmen anymore because they played a whole season. At this point, all these guys, they're not first-year starters anymore. So Carson Beck's made it pretty much all the way through his season without having the bad game yet. It's been very impressive to watch. Really turned it up, starting with that Kentucky game. You know, if that's the thing you were holding out on for Georgia this year, sorry, because they got a quarterback. And, again, of the contenders still left, I think it's he and Penix at the top and everyone else is a good bit below them. All right, Louisville at Miami. That was an interesting one going into the week. Because, you know, you got Louisville, this top 10 team, one loss, still technically in the playoff picture. Miami seemed to be in free fall, yet the spread was basically a pick em, So what's up with that? Um, we took Miami. That's what we like to do in those kind of spots when the lines make you raise your eyebrow. Take the other side. That won't be happening again. I'm not taking Miami in a close game ever again. It's been about two decades of the same stuff with them. Mark Rick's second year, there they were very good. They started, I believe, eleven and zero going into the last week of the season. They figured it out. But other than that, like every single season, it since like two thousand four, they just haven't been able to close, haven't been able to finish. It was the same thing here. They belonged on the field with Louisville. I mean, they might have been the better team on the field with Louisville. But they got defenders running into each other to give Louisville 70-yard touchdown passes. They got personal foul penalties to really screw up their field position at key moments of the game. Mario burning timeouts with the clock stopped on their last drive to keep them from getting closer for a shot at the end. It's just between the coaches and I don't know what the deal is with the players, but again, it's going on two decades now. They're just the dumbest team out there. By the way, worst fan base out there, too. The shots of that stadium for that game, for a top-10 team coming in there in a game that you can win, and the stadium is being generous, one-third full, and how many of those were even Louisville fans? I mean, you get what you pay for, folks. Like That should be a game where you have a lot of huge recruits there, and it's a chance to show off your game day atmosphere, and they go there and – Nobody's at the game. Nobody cares. And then the team blows the game on the field like always. It's just this vicious cycle that seems like it's never going to stop for Miami. But that's a long way of saying if it's supposed to be a close game, I'm never picking Miami again because they're going to find a way to lose it every time. All right, on to the picks. It was a good week for picks. I'll take them one at a time. By the way, I ran down my picks on the last show, what they were going to be. Ended up adding three more afterward. That's why you got to follow me on Twitter, at EPOCFB. That's where all those ads will come from. Along with just, you know, all my great wit and personality that shines through on that account. But for all the picks, that's where you got to follow me. Because I'll typically be adding a few from when I record to when the games actually kick off. One of those ads... Colorado plus four. Look, I didn't want to do it. I was sort of kicking it around in my head before I recorded. I decided, no, I'll leave that one out. I don't think I'll play that one. Then later in the week, you know, they let's just say Major League Baseball announced Ronald Acuna Jr. won the National League MVP, and some credit showed up in my account. What do you want me to say? I had something to play with. So I put a little, a tiny bit of that on Colorado plus four. That was a loser. They're cooked. Washington State rolled them. So going into set, that was Friday night, by the way. So going into Saturday, Northwestern plus three. They were playing Purdue. I told you Northwestern was going to win the game outright. They did to the plus three easy winner. 
BYU plus 24 and a half hosting Oklahoma. BYU should have won that game. Oklahoma got the win by seven, but man. Both starting quarterbacks were knocked out for most of the second half. BYU has the ball down at the two-yard line of Oklahoma, about to punch it in to take the lead in the early fourth quarter. And instead of punching it in to take the lead, the backup quarterback throws a 98-yard pick six. What are you going to do? Oklahoma wins by seven, but we win the plus 24-and-a-half easily. Next, the Miami pick. I mean, if it was anyone but Miami, they, they would have won. Now, Louisiana Monroe plus 38. They were at Ole Miss, remember. And I gave you this laundry list of reasons why Louisiana Monroe was going to cover that game. Ole Miss was only up 7-3 to three at halftime. Okay, we're golden here. So here's what I did. Here's another ad. I went in at halftime, took Ole Miss second half minus 14 and a half. So that one is just Ole Miss has to win the second half by more than 14 points. Ole Miss almost ends up covering the game. So they won the second half by a lot more than 14. So that's a winner. But it did still stay just under the 38. So that's two winners in one game. Thank you very much. Look, guys, anytime, because that accomplishes two things. Obviously, if it's a middle, you get both wins. But what it also does is hedge. In those situations, you can't lose both of those. So it's like, oh, man, that's risky having two of those bets out there in the same game. Yeah, but you can't lose both if you do it like that. Like, worst case scenario is you go one and one. Best case scenario, you hit the middle, you go two and oh, we dance in the streets. Now, that's a rare case where we had plus 38 for the game. And with Ole Miss having to cover 14 and a half in the second half, that meant they had to win the game by 19. That's a 20 point middle, guys. If you have an opportunity to give yourself a 20 point middle, you do it. That's what we did. That's a huge target. They hit it. Two winners in one game. Hope you're taking notes. Liberty, minus 27 and a half. They were playing UMass. They had it. Guys, they had this covered almost in the first quarter. But the second half, they put the backups in. The back door was open. UMass backdoor covers us. It hurts. Not a bad beat, but it's, that's kind of cost of doing business with the big spreads. But should have been a winner. Wasn't. Iowa, Illinois, over 30 and a half. It was so easy. It was there. It was there. But final score, like every single game they played for the last decade, Iowa somehow wins the game 15 to 13. It it makes no sense. But good for them. But that was another loss. Georgia, minus nine and a half. That was another late add for me. I added that the same time I added Colorado. So, We lost the Colorado ad. We won the Georgia ad. UCLA, USC, under 65 and a half. Final score is 38 to 20. You do the math. 58 is less than 65 and a half. That's a winner. NC State plus three. NC State's just playing good ball right now, guys. Water break. NC State's just playing good ball right now. They're beating everyone that comes in their path, it seems like. They're 8-3. and three. They're slowly 8-3. and three. How about that? Who saw that coming? I had North Carolina plus 7 against Clemson. Now, this was the same time as the Georgia game, and I was over watching the Georgia game with Nephew Mill on Saturday. So, I didn't get much eyes on this Clemson-North Carolina game. But just scrolling through, checking the score app, I saw something like North Carolina fumbled inside the 5-yard line at one point. And then also I saw right before halftime, I believe it was, Cade scrambled, looked for all the world on the replays like he was stopped short, but they gave him the touchdown. Then they had one of the replay officials, I guess, who just wasn't going to overturn anything, so they let that stand. So, you know, that one could have gone either way on the spread, but, you know, it is what it is. Lost that one. Clemson wins, I believe, 31-20 to was the score in that one. The first half parlay for Michigan, Ohio State. We got it in Michigan, Ohio State. Ohio State gets the ball back deep in its own territory with less than a minute left in the first half. They decide to knee it out. Now, you can say, okay, they decide to knee it out. Odds are they weren't going to score anyway, right? 
and I know this doesn't guarantee anything, but it really hurts when they come back out after halftime and rip off a 75-yard touchdown run on the first play of the second half. Just makes you wonder, if you would have just given the ball to Travion instead of needed out, what could have happened there? I don't – but that could have been a big hitter for us, but it's a loss. Oklahoma State minus seven. They were playing Houston. Oklahoma State wins by 13. That's a winner. Houston was incredibly lucky to even have it that close. So, you know, good pick. Got the winner there. We already mentioned it. Washington plus two and a half. That ended up being a winner. They won outright by two. Iowa State plus seven and a half. Here's where I'm going to cry bad beat. Iowa State plus seven and a half. They were playing Texas. Texas wins the game by 10. Iowa State scores a touchdown in, I believe, the third quarter. They score a touchdown. Then Texas blocks the extra point and runs it back for a two-point conversion. So that's a three-point swing. You know, instead of getting seven points for the touchdown, they're getting six and giving up two. So instead of gaining seven points for the touchdown, they're only getting four. That's a three-point difference. Then later in the game when Texas scores, because of how that score was sitting, they end up going for two and getting it instead of kicking the extra point. So that's four points of difference that came from that blocked extra point. If they just kick the extra point, boom. Iowa State loses by seven. We win the bet. But no. Then LSU minus 31 and a half for the late night game. Told you guys they're trying to get Jaden the Heisman. Boy, was I right. Eight total touchdowns against Georgia State. Poor Georgia State. They didn't do anything to deserve that. But that's where we are. When it's all said and done, that's a 10 and 7 week. 10 wins, 7 losses, which brings our season total to 100 wins, 99 losses, and 6 pushes. We're back on top. We're over 500. The race to 100 has been won by the good guys. That's good. Job ain't finished. Job ain't finished. Good to be where we want to be. Back above 500, but again, we still got a long way to go. We still got this week. We still got championship week. We still got bowls and playoff. Stay the course, stay the course, stay the course. And going back to remember how two weeks ago we had the terrible start, but then won our last five to get back to 500 that week. So counting those last five, we're 15 and seven in our last 22. Make your own decisions, though. On to this week. Going to go chronological with the big games. Civil War, Oregon State at Oregon. That one's Friday night. Oregon better come ready. We mentioned what LSU was doing last week. Oregon's priority better be to just win this game, not try to pad both stats, because Oregon State's going to come ready. Jonathan Smith, Oregon State head coach, he's going to scheme up an extra touchdown for Oregon State in there. Probably would have last week if it wasn't for the weather. I think Oregon wins the game. Not going to make a play on the spread. It's sitting at about two touchdowns. People are figuring out about Oregon. They're crushing people, but they haven't really – their resume isn't there. Like, it's to a point now where they've played like one good team, and it was Washington, and they put up a good showing, but they didn't win. They don't really have those good wins. All right, here's one we've been waiting for all year. Fox Big Noon kickoff. Buckeyes Wolverines in the big house. Ohio State has the best defense they've had in a while. Remember two years ago, it was only two years ago, 2021, when Oregon went in there to the horseshoe and just ran it down their throats and they couldn't stop it? Yeah, since that season, they've been steadily improving on defense, and they are they got a good defense this year. Now, Michigan's looked like a machine all year up until last week when they struggled with Maryland. Kyle McCord stinks. That's the Ohio State quarterback, for those of you who don't know. But they have the two best offensive weapons in the game, 
and running back Travion Henderson and, of course, Marvin Harrison Jr., a wide receiver. It's quite the conundrum here. It's going to be a pretty close game. I think both teams play their best game of the season. Eventually, the scandal has to catch up to them, right? Like, it's taken a toll on everyone. Harbaugh's not going to be on the sideline. It has to catch up to them sometime, right? Michigan's favored by three and a half. Ohio State covers the three and a half. And I think Ohio State wins the game. And buddy, if that happens, Ryan Day is going to hold court on the field in his interviews after the game. Let me tell you. You thought Lou Holtz got it bad after they beat Notre Dame? Whoo! And then close to what Harbaugh's going to catch in those post-game interviews from Ryan Day. Which is, again, why... It's so tragic that we don't get Harbaugh in this game for the pregame conversation and the postgame handshake. That is must-see TV that we, as a nation, are getting robbed of. Ohio State wins the game, but here's the thing. I hope I'm wrong. I'm going to be watching that game with an Ohio State plus three and a half, and I'm going to, well, I guess I hope Michigan wins by three or less. That's really hitting that sweet spot, but I hope Michigan wins the game. Just growing up in the South, you're sort of raised to hate Ohio State. Like, all those years of them making it to the national title game only to get destroyed. Like, you can't – I just – it's in my blood. I don't like Ohio State. I am a Harbaugh fan. I've sort of always pulled for Michigan over Ohio State in this game, which most of my life has been terrible for me. I don't know. I just think Ohio State finds a way. I think Ohio State finds a way. Hope I'm wrong. We'll see. 330 Iron Bowl. So Auburn was clearly holding something back last week, right? I mean, New Mexico State goes in there and beats them by 21. And it cost them. They clearly overlooked that game. And, you know, they paid for it. I don't think that affects this game. Bama's improved from where they were earlier in the season, no doubt. But they're still not that perfect, well-oiled machine sort of Bama team we're used to seeing. Plus, even when he's had those teams, Saban always struggles in Jordan-Hare Stadium. That's sort of one critique that Alabama fans have of Nick Saban is that he's never really fully bought into that rivalry being as important as everyone makes it out to be. He treats it just like another game. Now, there's something to that of the coach speak of, well, we treat every game the same, blah, 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 blah. He literally treats the Auburn game the same as he treats like a Mississippi State game or something. You know, it, and that gets them in trouble when they go to Auburn. Like, Auburn keeps it close with them every year when it's at Jordan Hare. Go back, so... 2011, Auburn stunk. They were 0-8 in conference. Bama killed them that year. But then 2013 was the kick six when Bama was favored. 2015, I think Bama probably covered. That was a Jay Coker, Derrick Henry year when Auburn wasn't anything special. But then since then, Auburn beats them in 2017. Auburn beats them in 2019. And Auburn had them dead to rights two years ago in 2021. The Auburn that went 6-6. Six and six, while Bama made the playoff, but Auburn was up 10 to nothing with less than half the fourth quarter left. Then Bryce Young does Bryce Young things and forces overtime, and they win in four overtimes. But I'm telling you, they keep it close here. Auburn 14 and a half is going to be the play, plus 14 and a half. And again, as a Georgia fan, I like that because it's going to just keep Bama occupied all day Saturday and not let them rest up too much. Apple Cup, Washington State at Washington, 4 o'clock. Like I said, the Huskies pulled it out when they had to last week. Penix made enough big throws when he had to. They're going to beat Washington State, but it's way too many points. I like Washington State plus 17. They would like nothing more 
than to stick into Washington in their last matchup as Pac-12 foes. They're going to be ready. Cam Ward's going to have something for him. Washington wins, though. Florida State at Florida. Real interesting one until it's not because the Knolls are going to roll. Everyone's talking about the Jordan Travis injury, and rightfully so. But Graham Mertz is out too. And Graham Mertz has been really good for Florida this year. He was sort of the punchline coming in, into the season because he was not very good at Wisconsin. But he's played well for him this year. And he's out too. So you got both teams with backup quarterbacks. You got one team who has had a terrible season and fighting for their life to get to a bowl. You got another one who's fighting for their life to make the college football playoff. Knowles minus six and a half. The Palmetto Bowl, 730 Clemson at South Carolina. So a few weeks ago, I got Clemson right when I told you they were going to beat Notre Dame outright. Last two weeks, I've been wrong on them. I took Georgia Tech to cover versus them. I took North Carolina to cover against them. Beamer always gets his team rolling in November. It's year three of it, and he's done it every time, so I think that's safe to say. Dabo's done the same thing this year. They were a dead team walking into October. They've gotten a roll in here in November. Now, those three November games, they won't have been at home. They're going to Columbia in this one. Both teams playing their best right now. Gamecocks have an edge at quarterback. Clemson's going to win the game, but Clemson's also going to cover the game. See, tricked you there. You thought I was going to say South Carolina's going to cover. Nuh-uh, Clemson minus seven. I'm going to be vulnerable right here and tell you all about something. I've had this idea for a few years now, and I've presented it to a handful of people, and they all hate it. And I get why. Because it's not the way things have always been done. I get it. But how cool would it be if this week that we're about to have, this slate of games, rivalry week, what if we took it off of week 13 and we moved it all the way up to week one? Just think about it. Let me know in the comments how much this ticks you off that I haven't said this. Light me up in the comments. Just hit the thumbs up button while you're at it. Just think about it. Think about how much more off-season anticipation there will be every year. Those dog days of summer. You know, there's always a few good games week one, sure, but most of them are garbage. And, you know, you're just trying to find some college football magazines in the bookstore. You know, you're just looking for anything Imagine what a bigger appetite there would be for that if in week one we had Clemson, South Carolina, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, Georgia Tech. We're going to leave Michigan, Ohio State late in the season. We're not going to mess with that, but all these other ones. Kentucky, Louisville. Texas, Texas A&M starting again next year. Like, if these are all week one instead of week 13 – I just think the offseason would be a lot more interesting. People would be a lot more hyped up about the start of the season. Fewer week one cupcakes. Like, every year, guys. Oh, week one is finally here. And we enjoy it because we've been waiting for nine plus months for it. But you get to noon in that week one and you're like, oh, most of these games kind of stink. It happened this year. Again, you're not complaining on week one because, you know, it's like the little bit of water you find after crossing the desert in the offseason. But another thing, it's all about the bragging rights, you know, between the people you work with, your family members, your friends, all that, these regional rivalries. By the end of the season, you're probably as dinged up as you're going to be as a team. 
wouldn't you rather the teams be as healthy as they could possibly be? Sure, you're going to lose a few guys in camp that might come back later in the season, but a lot more you're going to lose throughout the season who were there at the beginning, who won't be there at the end. Just something to think about. Something to think about. Light me up. Let me know how much you hate me in the comments for this. Just something to think about. I mean, we're blowing up literally every single other tradition of this sport. Why not one more? By the way, enjoy Michigan-Ohio State this week because starting next year, that game's probably just not going to matter. But in a 12-team playoff, doesn't matter who wins that game. Don't tell me, yeah, because they won a bye week. Shut up. Shut up. No, 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 no. A bye week or not a bye week is not the same as going to your conference championship in the playoff versus your season being over. It's not the same. People might rest starters in games like this in the future. If you're already in the playoff in your last or second to last game, like why wouldn't you? They do it in the NFL. Week 13 picks got me all ticked off. Thursday night, Thanksgiving night, Ole Miss minus 11. Mississippi State stinks. Ole Miss coming off the big loss to Georgia, then, like I said, the very slow start against Louisiana Monroe. Kiffin's going to want to crank it back up, leave a good taste in the mouth of all the boosters. Ole Miss minus 11. Plus, with you know how it ended last year, Mississippi State beat them. They'll be out for revenge. Easy pick. Ohio State plus three and a half. We've already talked about it. We're also on the over, over 46. Now, you think about these two teams, Michigan and Ohio State, it screams under. But then, for this game to go under 46, I think you have to go back to like 2012. Like, because you got to remember, a lot of these teams talk about, you know, rivalry and the rivalry games mean so much. This one, like, they literally hold stuff back all year that they know how to do to just deploy it in this game. And that's why the points are always so high. Like, right now you're thinking these two offense kind of struggling, not impressed with the quarterbacks. There's going to be guys just running wide open in this game probably because they're doing stuff they haven't put on tape yet. They do it every year. That's a real rivalry game. Troy minus 17. They're really good. Southern Miss really stinks. That's all that is. Syracuse minus three. I don't even remember who they're playing, but look, they fired Dino Babers. And they got an interim coach in there. And the interim's interim coach's first name is Nunzio. You got a one game interim named Nunzio. You got to ride him. Syracuse minus three. They're going to play hard for Nunzio. I can feel it. App State minus eight and a half. I'm sorry to my Georgia Southern brethren. App State by eight and a half. It's going to happen. Shout out to my friend Forrest, my sort of Georgia Southern correspondent. He always keeps me in the loop of what's going on with them. He's going to be at the game in Boone this weekend. He even said, eh, they're going to kill us. So, I mean, when a guy like him is saying that, who really bleeds true blue, you know it's not going to be pretty. App State minus eight and a half. Wisconsin, Minnesota under 42. Guys, it's Wisconsin, Minnesota. Like, what do you think is going to happen in that game? You think they're scoring six touchdowns? I don't. Auburn plus 14 and a half. We already mentioned it. Washington State plus 17, I already mentioned it. Florida State minus six and a half, I already mentioned it. Georgia minus 23. Look, I just, I understand they got bigger fish to fry. But I honestly just, I think the number's too low, man. I mean, they just beat a top 10 Ole Miss team by 35. They just went in to Neyland Stadium and won by 28. Felt like with their eyes closed, like 23 against Georgia Tech. I just – I'm not overly confident in it because once it's in hand, the starters will be out quickly. It just – the numbers just say it's too low of a line. That's, that's it. Clemson minus seven, I already talked about it. Now here's a bonus pick I might be giving out later. So, I said Oregon, Oregon State is Friday night, right? (sighs) 
everybody has got this foregone conclusion that's going to be Washington versus Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. However, if Oregon loses to Oregon State, which is entirely possible, Arizona goes to the Pac-12 championship if they beat Arizona State on Saturday. So, if Oregon loses on Friday night, then we're taking Arizona on Saturday because they're going to destroy Arizona State. If They probably are anyway, but if they got a Pac-12 championship berth on the line, they're destroying Arizona State. So, we're on Arizona minus 11 if Oregon loses Friday night. You follow? All right. Thanks for watching. Again, follow at EPOCFB. Like and subscribe on the video. Thanks, you guys.